questions on sex and gender, a holistic account of contemporary sex and gender issues, although I'll be focusing mainly on sex rather than gender. Um, and for those who don't know, holism is a system of thought that follows in the tradition of St. Thomas Aquinas. I'll be following basically the outline of the scholastic method, uh, which is the method St. Thomas used. That's St. Thomas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> male and female internal anatomy. 
Um, so for example, an individual might have one testis and one ovary, uh, so both. And the secondary sex characteristics, they also might have some combination of both. So <clears throat> these view, these reality, the reality of intersex people presents complications to the typical binary sex account. And um, Anne Foster Sterling uh, takes this as the, um, basically to, to show that, they're, that the binary sex account is false, that there are not just two sexes. And she actually takes it a step further and argues that sex isn't even a real category, um, a, a socially constructed category. Um, so, <coughs> let's see. Um, on Foster Sterling's view, male and female are merely social labels which we have chosen to apply to uh, individuals with a set of certain features. But nature does not simply give us these two kinds of individuals. Instead, nature gives us a whole assortment of individuals with varying combinations of features. The individuals to whom we apply the labels male and female then are in no sense ontologically privileged. The category male or female is no more real or natural than potential categories created for individuals with various intersex conditions. If the socially constructed category of male refers to individuals who are genetically XY, have a penis, scrotum, testes, produce sperm, etc., why should we think that this category is any more real than a category created to fit an individual who is XY, has testes, but also vagina, breasts, etc.? <coughs> both types of individuals occur in the natural world, so both, argues Foster Sterling, are equally natural in an ontological sense. It is only because we have socially designated certain categories as normal that we give preference to one category over another. And so, she writes, labeling someone a man or a woman is a social decision. We may use scientific knowledge to help us make the decision, but only our beliefs about gender, not science, can define our sex. Um, so it seems that a case can be made that Underlying Foster Sterling's arguments is a kind of nominalism and gen general anti-realism about biological sex. There are individuals who have certain features, which we decide to label as male or female, but maleness and femaleness as such are not fundamentally real components of the world. At least they are not real structures which exist prior to or apart from our social and cultural interpretations of them. Other thinkers have taken this idea even further than Foster Sterling. So Monique Wittig states that there are, not, there are not one or two sexes, but as many sexes as there are individuals. This is certainly a radical nominalism, and as Carrie Hole shows, it is echoed in the writings of many contemporary feminists. Uh, Foster Sterling later, herself later backtracked, backtracked on her claim about five sexes from the quote we saw at the beginning admitting that I'd intended to be provocative, but I had also been writing tongue in cheek, and instead insisting upon a new paradigm which sees sex and gender as best conceptualized as points in a multi-dimensional space. She also writes that sex is a vast, infinitely malleable continuum that defies the constraints of even five categories. As Carrie Hole also points out, the image of a continuum invokes the idea of a series of infinitesimal transformations from male to female. This is made explicit by Alice Dreger, who writes that the sex spectrum is like the color spectrum. Nature provides us with a range where one type blends imperceptibly into the next. The implication is that trying to pick out a specific type and distinguish it from others is impossible, since nature does not really give us a set of distinct types, but rather a multiplex palette of colors indistinguishably blended into each other. Many writing in this vein will still acknowledge that male and female might constitute two extreme, two extreme opposing ends of the spectrum, but one wonders whether even this is too simplistic, given their underlying philosophy and related conclusions. Um, so basically, this, this position was that sex is not a fundamentally real category, it's a socially constructed category, um, and that as such it doesn't make sense to refer to just um, and, and there might be a social function for having the two categories, for labeling individuals. Um, but, but if there is a social function for that, then we need a lot more categories than just 
and email. Um, so said contra, on the contrary, um, this is just um, a passage from Genesis 1. Then God said, let the earth bring forth every kind of living creature, tame animals, crawling things, and every kind of wild animal. And so it happened. God made every kind of wild animal, every kind of tame animal, and every kind of thing that crawls on the ground. God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame animals, all the wild animals, and all the creatures that crawl on the earth. God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fertile and multiply. So, obviously, I don't, I'm not trying to give a, um, a theological interpretation of, like a defense of this, of an interpretation of this passage, but I think this is a passage that could be pointed to um, by Christians specifically to defend the case that um, in the natural order, there are real natural kinds, that male and female are real categories, and that there are two categories, male and female. Um, but now moving on to um, my own response, my own position, um, from a Thomistic point of view. So some general Thomistic metaphysical principles. Um, first we have matter and form. Um, so. Um, and I'll be talking about these specifically from the, pers from the perspective of what human beings are. So what are human beings? For St. Thomas, following Aristotle, human beings are composites of body and soul. But this should not be understood after the manner of our Cartesian substance dualism, which stipulates that body and soul are two distinct substances. Rather, St. Thomas maintains that body and soul are specific instances of the more general principles of form and matter. On this view, all natural substances are composites of the distinct principles of matter and form. The best way to grasp the meaning of these principles is to think of the image of a brick house. The bricks which make up the house are its matter, but bricks alone are not sufficient to make a house, since bricks should also be organized to form a variety of other things as well. What is also needed is a specific structure or design which organizes the bricks such that they constitute a house. This is the house's form. Without form, the house would simply be a pile of bricks. Without matter, the house would simply be an idea in the architect's mind or a blueprint drawn out on paper. Of course, as Aristotle and St. Thomas would point out, houses aren't natural substances, they're artifacts constructed by taking already existing substances and imposing an external form and function upon them. In natural substances, the principles of form and matter are even more real and more interconnected. The form is the source of a thing's activities, powers, and natural tendencies. It is also the principle of, a, of the species of a thing. So an oak tree is an oak tree by virtue of having the form that it does. Matter, on the other hand, is the principle of individuation of things. It is what enables multiple instances of the same species to exist. So this oak tree and that oak tree are similar insofar as they share a common form, but they differ and are unique individuals insofar, insofar as their common form is instantiated in different material subjects. Again, it might be helpful to think of the example of a house. Two houses could have the exact same form exact same architectural design and layout, but differ insofar as this house is made up of these specific bricks, and that house is made up of those bricks. Another important distinction to make is that between substance and accident, or substantial form and accidental form. Substance is something that can exist primarily and in itself, while accident is something that can only exist in another. Think, for instance, of water and wetness. Water is something that exists on its own, thing in itself, while wetness as such does not exist, but only exists as a characteristic of something else, such as water. Um, now for Aristotle and St. Thomas, all living things consist of body and soul, where body is the material principle and soul is the formal principle, and, and the substantial principle, since living things are substances rather than accidents. The term soul might carry with it something of a negative connotation, and that it is typically associated with 
uh, various religious and spiritual doctrines, but for Aristotle and St. Thomas, a soul in the broad sense is just the formal principle of life which all living things possess, both bacteria and plants and lizards, no less than humans. The most fundamental kind of soul is that had by the simplest forms of life, such as bacteria and plants, and is called the vegetative soul. It has powers such as growth, nutrition, and reproduction. Animals have these vegetative powers as well, but also have powers such as locomotion and sense perception. Humans too have all these lower powers, but also have a unique power, that of rationality, hence the classical Aristotelian definition of humans as rational animals. Um, now that we have a general idea of what human beings are, we can turn to asking about what sex and gender in particular are. Obviously, given our foregoing categories, sex and gender must be accidents rather than substances. For maleness and femaleness, um, on the Thomistic view, don't actually exist as individual beings in the world in their own right, but maleness and femaleness, femaleness rather, are characteristics of living things and hence are accidents inhering in living substances. Of course, this assumes that the categories of male and female are real in the first place. What reason do we have to think this, especially in light of the arguments already given to the contrary? To answer this, let's consider some of the features we earlier discussed as typical of each sex. For males, this means features such as having a penis, testes, and producing sperm, while for females, it means features such as having a uterus, vagina, ovaries, fallopian tubes, and producing eggs. Notice that these features all bear some re relation to reproduction, which is one of the distinctive characteristics of living things. All living things engage in some kind of reproduction, whether sexual or asexual. Humans, like all mammals, reproduce sexually. Sexual reproduction is a power or capability essential to and inherent in a human nature itself. Similar powers would include that of sight, hearing, local motion, growth, nutrition, etc. But reproduction is a unique power in that, at least for most mammals, it inherently requires at least two individuals working in conjunction to achieve its proper end. More specifically, sexual reproduction requires the combination of two distinct kinds of gametes, sperm and egg. Human nature, considered in the abstract, has the ability to produce both kinds of gametes, but human nature tends to divide these amongst individuals such that some individuals produce sperm and others eggs. But the mere production of sperm or eggs is not sufficient for reproduction, which requires that the two meet and interact. Hence, nature has equipped humans with various parts and organs functionally ordered towards the goal of allowing sperm to fertilize the egg and allowing the fertilized egg to gestate and develop until it can be delivered. Um, this talk of ends, goals, and orderedness refer to the Aristotelian and Thomistic understanding of natural teleology or final causality. On this account, natural substances are intrinsically ordered or directed towards certain ends, goods, and activities. This idea is inherent in the notion of a power, for a power is just a capacity for some end or activity. So the power of sight is intrinsically ordered towards the activity of seeing or vision. In animals, this power is carried out through the function of various bodily organs, such as the eyes. And so far as the intrinsic function of eyes is ordered towards sight, sight can be said to be the proper or natural end of the eyes. Sight is what eyes are naturally for. It is the essential natural. Uh, it is the essential nature of eyes to see, and this is still true even if there are some eyes which don't actually see or cannot work properly. Such instances are defects which are possible because of the composite material nature of eyes. Consider again our example of a house. A house has a certain design which, in itself, is perfect as itself. I.e., it is perfectly this design. <coughs> But by being instantiated in the world with certain materials, the house necessarily opens, it up, opens itself up to imperfection. Bricks can wear out and fall apart over time. Perhaps a tree might fall and collapse a certain section, or a tornado might blow part of the roof off. Such events do not show that the house in question doesn't have any design. It simply shows that material, physical things are subject to defect. Similarly, blindness doesn't show that eyes aren't foresight, it simply shows that eyes can be defective and thus fail to fully realize their natural end. The power of sight, however, isn't realized through a single organ. An eye on its own is not sufficient for sight. The power of sight might 
to better be thought of as a whole system of interacting parts and functions, all of which are together ordered towards the overall end of sight. And the same I would suggest is true of sets. Reproduction requires a whole host of different functioning parts and organs interacting in a specific way. And as we've already indicated, reproduction requires the interaction of two different overall systems. Human nature tends to divide in these two distinct kinds of systems. One system is designed to produce sperm and to inject sperm into another. The other system is designed to produce eggs capable of, capable of receiving sperm and being fertilized, as well as to gestate and deliver the resulting fetus. Human nature as a whole, then, tends towards these as two distinct reproductive systems and hence as two distinct overall reproductive powers. And these are precisely what constitute biological sex. Sex is a category which marks one as having a certain reproductive power. As such, I offer the following definitions of the male and female sexes. A male is an individual whose body is fundamentally ordered towards the reproductive function of fatherhood, and a female is an individual whose body is fundamentally ordered towards the reproductive function of motherhood. Uh, note that insofar as there is no alternative reproductive function or power, there can be no alternative sex. Thus, there are only two possible biological sexes which human nature tends towards, male and female. Note, too, the implication that it is also impossible to change one's biological sex, even with hormone therapy and sex reassignment surgery. For these may alter some physical characteristics of the body, but they cannot alter the body's fundamental reproductive tendency. They do not give the body a new reproductive function. Um, and so finally, um, <clears throat> very briefly, because I'm out of time, but the reality of intersex individuals, I argue, I don't, I don't think it's helpful to think of intersex individuals as constituting a, um, a third sex or an alternative sex. I think um, it definitely is an epistemic challenge to de determine uh, how to think about and how to categorize intersex individuals, but I think um, on an ontological level, I think given what I've said, um, it's best to think of intersex conditions as uh, defects of the natural tendency of human nature towards these two sexes, um, just like various conditions might result in blindness of the eyes um, that don't mean that the eyes aren't foresight, it just means that physical defects can occur. And in the same way, I think um, that's how we should think of intersex conditions, not as constituting other natural kinds of sexes, but as constituting defects from the two uh, natural sexes. sort of left the question open as to um, how we should categorize intersex individuals. So some people might think um, intersex people are people who are both sexes, um, or intersex people are people who are neither sex, and they just don't fully have either of the two sexes. Um, or you might think that um, it's just kind of on an individual basis, we have to determine, we know, some people might say, we know that fundamentally each individual is either male or female, it's just not clear in this case whether the person is male or female. So I, I don't have a, like I don't know which one of those is the best um, response. My main point was that however we decide is the best way to categorize intersex individuals, I don't think that they constitute um, an alternative sex, I think sex is best thought of as um, 
for these two natural reproductive capacities that seem to make these things go in intersex position, where unisex kind of um, natural symmetry, but not a natural sex in itself. So I didn't go into this um, in much detail, but St. Thomas would differentiate natural substances from artificial substances. Um, and so technology um, is advancing rapidly and it has a lot of implications for um, reproduction and how we reproduce. Um, but I think the thing to say would be that um, those are specifically artificial, like technology in general is artificial and doesn't constitute a natural substance. So it wouldn't um, change the fundamental tendencies of human nature. It would just um, give humans added on abilities, sort of like night vision goggles don't change human nature, like the human ability to see, they just sort of add on. Um, but, but I still think that in that case, those reproductive powers would be artificial and wouldn't constitute like a natural sex. Sterling, who I've interacted with a lot, she originally had a number at about 4% of all births, um, but then she later changed that to about 1.7% of all births. But I think that's a, a contested number. I think most people think that it's lower than 1.7 and probably lower than 1% in general. Uh, but there's no like set consensus. <laughs> Either male nor female, or both male and female. Uh, how to think about then traditional sexual ethics, which describes homosexual uh, people? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think in general, um, sex and gender open up a whole host of complicated ethical and pastoral questions. Um, I think that. Catholic view. I think the, as a Catholic, the, the church would say it's they're not male or female. Um, either that they they just shouldn't they should abstain from all sexual activity and from all um, romantic relationships. Or um, in medieval times, there was a that can the canon law was for intersex individuals was basically um, choose one and live as that. And um, if you deviate from your choice, then you've broken the law. But um, so those are two different possibilities. I think especially if you can, if there's both, I think it fundamentally depends on like fertility. Like if you're fertile and able to reproduce as one or the other 